We started our last uh, service with a personal question, so I'm going to start again with another personal question. Do we here at LCC experience a lot of criticism, and how do you personally handle criticism? To start right off with it, right? Um, uh, no, honestly, we don't uh, receive a lot of criticism. At least it doesn't, it doesn't get filtered back to me, uh, a lot of it. I I'll say it this way. I don't get a lot of criticism that I get filtered back to me. So I don't know that um, people are complainers here at the church. Um, so it, it's not something that I think is a, a bad issue that we deal with. But we try to learn from criticism. So we don't have a mindset that all criticism is bad. Neither do we have a mindset that all criticism is good. And so we have to kind of filter that just like any other person would. So it, it still stings at times whenever someone criticizes you. So I, I don't know if I'll ever get to the point as a leader that I'll, I don't know if it's my pride or what, but they're just, when someone criticizes something that you've done, there's a part of it that it stinks. I will say the older I get and the more secure I am, that it stinks less and it allows me to learn quicker. And I think that's where we are as a church is uh, if we do get criticism, we ask the question, why? You know, is there truth to this? What is true? What's not true? Because not every criticism, the, the person doesn't always have enough information. Um, but we have learned and it's helped us be better leaders. So sometimes it's a, we've learned through criticism, it's because we're not communicating well. That's even kind of the heart behind this series is we want to make sure that we're communicating about a few things. Um, so sometimes it's a communication thing. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Um, sometimes we are wrong, and we have to admit that and apologize and fix that. Sometimes the person who's criticizing is wrong, and we have to confront that and, and let them know. So uh, for us, we try to have a, a humble attitude as best we're able to say, what can we learn from that? And, and sometimes, most often when someone criticizes, not one party's right, completely right, and one's completely wrong. It's oftentimes you have to have a relational conversation to figure out uh, what's healthy and where the truth lies. And so that's what we try to do in criticism. Uh, and then also, I would say for me personally, um, not all criticism makes its way all the way to me uh, because the, the pastors do shield some of that. And not because um, I'm weak, I would hope, as much as I think we have to realize we do need to protect the hearts at times of leaders. And so some criticism that has nothing to do with me gets stopped before it gets to me. And the teams that it has to do with, they handle it. So it's not like if every single person criticizes, I get that on my desk. There are a lot of criticism that could happen on other levels, never even makes its way to me, and that's okay, because it makes its way to the right department, and then they can address it that way. If somebody does have a concern, what's the best way to approach that? I would say relationally, right up front, schedule a meeting, come talk with us. I think people... Um, would be pleasantly surprised at how receptive we are. Um, so the worst thing to do is to go and talk to someone else and just talk behind the scenes and try to stir up dissension because that is not the first step toward reconciliation, toward fixing anything. It actually creates more confusion. Just if you have a relational touch with someone that's on staff, preferably a director or a pastor that actually has some influence in that, schedule a meeting with them and come and talk to them. And uh, our experiences, then they'll quicker, quickly get um, some, uh, some resolution to that. And if you have no relationship with anyone, because maybe you're newer to the church, then just schedule a meeting. When Sherry answers the phone, uh, she'll ask what the meeting's about, tell her, and then she'll put you to the appropriate person. And uh, sometimes she has to ask us, and we'll say, yeah, you know, this pastor needs to handle that. Um, but yeah, just come right to us and talk. We, we are confident that if we both approach the meeting with open hearts, in our past, we've been able to reconcile any tension, and uh, most often people are surprised at how well it's received, and, um, and we're not upset or even threatened by it. We're pretty secure in what we're doing, so um, if someone comes and talks to us, it doesn't threaten that. It, it, for us, it's an opportunity uh, to better explain what we're doing. It's hard to believe, but we are a year away from moving into our new building, uh, and know. it seemed like just yesterday that we announced the big news, and so a lot of individuals are just kind of wanting an update of where the building's at, where kinda, what's kind of yeah. the progress with things right now. Okay, so uh, let me here's an example. Let me apologize. I haven't done a good job of keeping this at the forefront of our church, um, partly because I'm just not wired that way. Like, uh, it's um, promoting things is harder for me. Uh, part of it is just we got so busy with other things. So I apologize about that. We will do better from this point out because we'll actually have weekly stuff that we can report. So let me just give you a little bit of background on this. So we outgrew this space a couple of years ago. We started to see us trending that way. Um, we had pretty consistent growth numbers over the last five years. And so we 
started a few years ago charting where our growth was heading, and we knew when it got, well, actually this year, 2016, we knew at this point if it continued on that growth pattern, we would outgrow this building, and we held true to that growth pattern. So Joe and I initially started the process of looking at other spaces, and, and we finally found uh, really a, the supernatural location, and I don't use that term lightly. God supernaturally gave us our new building, uh, was able, which was the Roses building that just, they just went out of business. Um, that location is ours. We bought it, the Centerpoint Plaza. With purchasing that, we are keeping the other three businesses there, Save a Lot, O'Reilly Auto Parts, and the rent-to-own place. And with the lease income from that, it covers the entire mortgage. So it was, in essence, God gave us a building. And so um, that, you just, like when I tell my other pastor friends that, they're jealous, right? And, you know, and, uh, and, and I don't talk smack about it, but because, uh, you know, God loves us all equally, you know, just... Um, some of us, he's more generous with, and uh, I'm just, I'm just joking. I really am just joking. I know, I, I, I'm sarcastic to a fault at times. So I'm joking. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, so we have this building. So we uh, had to raise the funds to then remodel it, and so we did that as a church. Um, people pledged about one and a half million dollars uh, toward that, and the overall project's going to be larger than that. But that will allow us the what we need to do it. So construction is scheduled to start in the next few weeks as the permits continue to come in, and, um, and we're so excited about that. It's going to take at the most a year of construction, and then at the end of that, uh, we don't know the date until we actually do demo. So there's some demo in that building that we have to do. Once we get that all done, we'll have a better target date of when we're going to get in there, and it's going to be sometime 2017. We'll move all uh, over the there uh, on Sundays. So some of the things that if people want to know about and they can pray about is we haven't sold this building. And we had some interest, but that fell through. So we're looking to either lease or sell this building. And we're praying about that. Uh, backup plan, though, just a, a total disclosure is um, we might keep this building and use it uh, for classrooms still in the future and uh, office space and things like that. So uh, how we're wired is, and this is where I was a few weeks ago when that deal fell through, is I just simply went to God and said, okay, you obviously closed this door for this season. Do you want us to keep the building? And if so, show us what to do. And uh, so we're praying about that now. And, and it's possible God will say for us to keep the building. And we're okay with that because if God's leading it, he's going to bless that. And uh, so that's what we're praying about. So we're going to do phase one is going to be that building. Phase two would be a gym that would be built in addition to that. And then possibly phase three or maybe with two, we don't know, based on finances, would be building office space and classrooms over there. But that's where we're debating now. Do we just keep this building and have off-site some more adult classrooms? Uh, so all the classrooms would be adult. The children would all be done over there. But So that's what we're talking about. So once the construction starts, once a week, uh, we'll go over there and film uh, an update video. We'll keep information. So information will start to come a lot more now. In between the capital campaign and people pledged and now, not a ton has taken place because it's all drawings and going that whole process and permits. It's not super exciting, not a ton to report. Um, so that's my fault, but now it's going to start getting exciting. We'll go over there once a week and do uh, use social media. So maybe like Facebook has live video or um, some of those other uh, apps they have and go over there and just keep people updated and show them what's going on. We're starting to get to some more of the detail-oriented type stuff with the building. Who comes up with the design and, and who decides on that, I guess? The, the design in the inside was done with our senior staff, which is all of our pastors and directors. So we sat down first in a meeting with our, design, uh, our designer and builder, so the architect and builder, and they asked us a ton of questions. So that, was, that meeting was, it was two, three meetings, and it was multiple hours, probably all said and done, seven or eight hours, where they're asking, now, what, what do you want in this? Not, not so specific as much as what are your needs. And then they came back with a preliminary drawing. So does this meet your guys' expectations? And they gave it to us. We were shocked at how close to the final it was. Even they were shocked because they said they've never had it as fluid a process as that. And so then once we had that, we like upstairs in room 220, we have a big projecting, uh, projection screen. We put that drawing up there, and we just sat there as a senior, actually our entire staff at this point, all of our assistants, everyone, and we just said, all right, let's talk through a normal Sunday. What does it look like? And, and we had to make tweaks and changes. We realized, okay, well, if check-in is here, it's going to create a bottleneck here. So it was a whole staff process. We went back, gave them some changes. They changed it. So that process went back and forth five or six times. Um, a funny one was in the initial drawing when we thought it was almost set, um, we realized in the new building we had less nursery space than we currently had here. 
how we missed that, we, we were like, what? It was like all of a sudden in a meeting, we realized that, and, and uh, we are like, oh, that's a big mistake. And so that's why we went through, that's like the understatement of today, the big mistake of that. So we went through and made some changes. But now we're, we've looked at it as much as we physically can. And uh, so that was a whole staff process. Now the actual like decoration side of it um, is going to be more of a, a, a limited group than that. And um, Joe and myself and Ron and, and some of the seniors, and we'll get other input into that, but we're, we're looking at big picture, what's, what's going to be sustainable for years. Um, but the actual design of it was a whole staff um, project. Why are we pouring money into a new building when we could use the money to meet people's needs and serve them here? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> well, here, here, this will sound like I'm going to dismiss that question, and I don't mean to be so dismissive, but I would say I don't agree with the premise of that, con that question in that what's being asked in that question is the assumption that money could be used to meet a greater need, and I don't think it can. I think we are meeting the greatest need possible. See, if you meet someone's secondary need and miss their primary need, then you really haven't done them a service. So for us as a church, we are called, our primary need that we're called to meet is a spiritual need. Our goal is to see Lancaster saved, first and foremost, before anything else, before we help anyone else, the homeless, <clears throat> those that are struggling. We need to help them. I'm not at all diminishing that, but our calling is an eternal calling. So we want to see people saved. The only way that we can have a ministry that's effective to being a, a bright light and impacting the community is we need a new facility. Otherwise, this facility is going to start to suffer. Or it's even going to impact our potential to do ministry. And so then we will not be able to provide that primary need that's so prevalent in, in our culture. So we are using the finances in the best possible way by building a facility that will allow us to increase our capacity of ministry, which means we'll be able to impact more families, disciple more children, impact more adults, then do more ministries where we can work, focus on families and marriages and addiction relief, and then support other ministries in town. But that first need, the spiritual need, is the primary need. So we are spending the money in the best possible way to do that. Um, <clears throat> That said, once we do that, then we will start meeting uh, even more so. Now, we're meeting the other needs, don't get me wrong, but we're focusing on this. A second part of that that I don't think people realize is we took special offerings to do the building. We haven't changed how we're spending any of our other budget. So our other budget is still doing the exact same ministry it was last year, even more so than last year, and we'll do more ministry next year. So we haven't changed that. This were special, special monies that came in from our people for this building, and we're not compromising ministry at all. And, um, and so, you know, hopefully that answers that question. And, uh, and then we're not being extravagant in the building. We're not at all. It's the only, the joke is the only extravagant thing in the building is the fireplace. There's one little fireplace in the front, but that's even, we're using that so that people can have groups out there and, and meet and stuff. But, so. Why do we keep going on missions trips when we need money for the new building? Uh, yeah, we're, see, we're not going to stop doing ministry so that we can build a building. If that was the case, we wouldn't build the building. Um, so we're, mi uh, missions is of vital importance for so many reasons. We want everyone to have a global mindset of the, the church. The, and when I mean church, I'm not talking about LCC. I'm talking the universal church. The only way people can have a global mindset is to, to go, I think, and to experience mission, mission work and to work in that. So we set aside 10% of our overall budget that we use toward benevolence. Now, 90% of those that go on the trips, they raise their own funds. We, we help some if, they, if there's a gap there. But if someone will put in the work, then we'll, we'll help in that. But most people raise their own funds for that trip. So again, they're raising special funds to go on the missions trip. We do pay for our staff to go because they're going on multiple trips a year. It'd be impossible for them to raise that type of money. Um, we support it so that we can lower the cost for the kids. So there's some monies that we put into it and adults that go. Uh, but we're going to continue to do missions. That's not something that's ever going to change. Uh, we want all people to be exposed to that. We want to bless ministries around the world. If God has blessed us, he gives so that we can give. And uh, submissions are of vital importance. And like I said, we're not going to stop doing ministries so that we can build a church. You've answered the why behind the new building. And uh, is growth something that we want? And are, are there any concerns that have come along with a growing church? You know, does it make it mm -hmm. less and does it make it more impersonable? You know, are there issues with that? Yeah. Um, we, yeah. Do we want a growing church? Absolutely. Uh, I want a pastor of church of 80,000 here in town. And um, you laugh, but I'm serious. And uh, don't laugh at me, Brandon. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> But what I mean by that is that I know we're not going to pastor a church of 80,000, but if there are 80,000 people that are unsaved in Lancaster, that's our target number. 
And, and we don't say that to be dramatic, and I know that's a, you know, you could put that on Twitter, that sounds cool, but, but I'm saying that literally is our perspective, is we're going to go until there's no more. We're going to go until God tells us to stop. So we do want to grow, but sometimes when that question is asked, is there's an underlying, um, there's an underlying meaning of that question that is somewhat insulting, and that is people have asked us, oh, do you guys just want a large church? Uh, referring kind of to the leaders, specifically me, as if I'm doing this for my ego or something like that. And, and the only thing I can say is hopefully I have enough credibility with people that those that know me know that's not true. But I'll just be really honest. A larger church is just different and it's more difficult. So when, as we grow, it's not, um, we're not against growth. We just have to be really purposed to maintain the health of a church so that it grows healthfully. Um, one of the illusions in the church world is that smaller churches are more personable. Um, they're not. It, a church is either personable or it's not. I've known churches that are 100 people that I wouldn't invite a friend to because they're impersonable. I've known churches that are 2,000 I would not invite a friend to because they're impersonable. But then I can flip that. I know churches that are 100 that are the most welcoming, loving church. I know churches that are 1,200, just like ours, that is very welcoming and loving. And so what you have to do is be very purposed about it. So for us as a church, what we're being purposed is we're trying to make our church get smaller as we get larger. So we tell people, I mean, I say this all the time and it resonates when I say it because I've had people come up to me and go, what you said is absolutely true. I realized that after the fact, but what attracted you to our church? If you do not get in purpose relationships, what attracted you will ultimately repel you. So you'll come to a church, the worship will be something that you connect to, the music is, is high quality, you feel the presence of God, it's, it's awesome, you'll like the teaching, if you have kids in the children's or youth ministry, they'll love it, and so you'll be drawn to that, but if you don't develop purpose relationships, this church will all of a sudden start to feel cold to you, and you won't know why. You'll start to feel distant, and you'll start to think, well, there it really is impersonable, because there's a lot of people that you see on a weekly basis, but they don't know your name. So you have to get into relationships where people know your name so that you will be missed. So people will check on you when you walk in. There's nothing better than when you walk in and someone recognizes you and they go, hey, it's good to see you. And so that's what we want. We want people to get in volunteer ministries to build relationships. We want them to get in connect groups to build relationships. It's the vision of our church. We talked a lot about that last service, but we want people in purposed relationships. So as we get bigger, we're just becoming more and more purposed to feel smaller and to, to get people in those relationships. Um, the truth is, uh, if you go to a church, no matter the size of that church, you're going to have a handful of purposed relationships. So if you have a church of 100, you might know 100 names, but you're going to have five people you really connect to, or 10. <clears throat> if you go to a church of 1,000, you might know 100 names, but you're going to really connect to five or 10. And so that's what we're trying to help people. Get into those five and 10 relationships, get connected, invest, and then the church won't feel so big. Um, so Because size of a church... Size does not always determine the health of a church, but size of a church does allow us to have more potential of impact uh, just because of more resources and more talents and abilities in a place, but we have to funnel that to make sure that we're also maintaining health in that. So <clears throat> you didn't ask all of this, but even behind the scenes, we're really purposed in maintaining structural health so that as we grow, we're even effectively leading our staff and therefore leading our volunteers. So we even made dramatic changes this past year, hiring staff for that purpose. At another location, are there any ministries that will change or any new ones that we're potentially going to add? Yeah, some will change. Um, um, so in our new building, we'll have more children's space, which will allow us to divide the ages better. Um, so uh, like first place club will not be one group. It'll be two groups in the new building. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. They'll have their own individualized space to get specialized ministry. So one building or one room will be uh, K and first grade. One uh, room. So it's a big room with meeting rooms off of it. Uh, will be uh, second and third grade. Then one will be fourth through six. Um, so that will change how we do children's ministry. Um, that's about it, I think. Um, so we're not going to we're not going to add ministries for the sake of adding ministries. We try to do a few things so that we can do them very well, and we're going to have that same vision when we're in the new building. So I, we don't look right now to add any more ministries. Now, that, that said, we're still developing a counseling ministry and some things like that, but that's if we stayed here, we would do that. So that's not necessarily building-specific. That's just ministry-specific. Will there be any change to how Sunday services look? Hopefully, yeah. Um, so l let's acknowledge something. So in case this might not even have registered with anyone, 
we tried Saturday service, and we just never got the momentum we needed, and it didn't fix our Sunday problem. We, before that, tried a 1 p.m. Sunday service, and that didn't work uh, at all. That, that was... Uh, that was bad. And uh, so it, those who came kind of liked it, a couple of them, but it was like all seven of them. You know, it was, it was rough. Um, and so we had to go to three Sunday morning services the way that we have them now. The good of it is it's, it really is good that we're able to fix the attendance issue, and we think that will uh, work until we get into our new building. The bad of it is we've had to reduce our services down to an hour and five minutes. And, um, and we're not huge fans of that. I don't know. I think some people have sensed that. The services at times have felt real regimented. And uh, we've been really purposed in the last two, three months to kind of tweak that and change it um, to where we, we have a little bit more flow to it. So even today, uh, first service, we were able to pray over specifically Jim and Cherie. Um, and just if it went long, it went long. We're not, we weren't concerned about that. And we pray for needs. So we're aware of that. And so all I would say to people, if that is something that is you're not loving, we don't love it either. Uh, just understand it's a season. Bear with us because we don't know another strategy right now. And uh, in the new building, we'll probably go back down to two services initially, spread them back out, which will give us enough flow that a normal service will be around an hour and 15 minutes again, but it will have enough time in between the services that if we need to go longer, we can. Um, so we, we believe in being planned in your services, but then also freedom so that we're not hindering where God might lead us to do. Um, so, yeah, services will tweak a little bit in the new one. Are there going to be any services for young teens or the youth, and is that going to change when we go into the building? We have services now, so what do you mean by that? Oh, for Sunday services. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, no, I, I don't think anything's going to change that way, and it's not just because of a lack of space that we did that. W across the, the country, it's, I think the numbers, isn't like 95% of kids that are 18, when they get out of high school, they quit going to church. A lot of that is because churches have isolated children for too long. So we believe in purpose, discipleship, and children's ministry, but we do think there's a healthy age where they start to become a part of the adult congregation. So we wouldn't bring children in on a Sunday morning because I'm talking about adult topics. I mean, there are times I say things that are PG-13, not inappropriate or crude, but I mean, just the, the what topic we're talking about. But we believe when kids get to that 12, 13-year-old age, so seventh grade, they need to start being a part of the adult service, hearing adult topics, uh, worshiping and connecting with their parents during worship. And so that won't change in the new building. That's not a space issue. That's a ministry strategy issue. So I even asked um, Travis, who's, who's taken over with the youth, I asked him, I knew Joe's opinion because we shaped it together. And I asked Travis, and he said, no, I don't, I don't see that changing ever. Um, so if we ever saw a need, we would tweak it. It's, that's not a sacred cow, but right now we don't have any plans to change it. Could you remind us a little bit about what's going on on the 6th and how that how important that is for us as a church? Yeah, I'm so excited about it. So Wednesday, July 6th is the first time we'll be able to go in as a congregation into our new space. And so I got to go in there this past week. Ron and I and uh, Joe and I uh, took a tour of there, and it's all cleared out, and it is uh, it's so cool. Uh, you go in there, and it just... For us, we're looking at, okay, we have the drawings, and we're like, so our sanctuary would be to this pole, and this would be children's area, and we're kind of envisioning it. It's just a really cool space, and we're super excited about that. So July 6th, we're going to we're gonna mark the ground with tape of all where all the rooms are going to be, sanctuary, hallways, kids' areas, and we have some other artistic elements in there, but we're going to go in there as a congregation, and we're going to pray over the building, and we're going to worship. And this is a supernatural moment. I can't stress that enough. It's not just an open house. It is we're praying and dedicating this space to God and asking him to do things in the future that we believe he will. I mean, we're asking him to change lives of children and youth and adults, people being set free from addictions, marriages restored. I mean, we're going to fill the building with worship and praise and prayer. And uh, so I'm, I'm asking, and I would say, if you don't show up, you're rebellious, okay? You know, I'm going to go that far now. And um, because I'm asking as your pastor, I'm not being silly about that. Uh, I'm asking you to make it a priority and to be there uh, July 6th. And uh, it's going to be a great night. We're going to have time of worship. Uh, the band's going to be playing too, and it's going to be very special. You touched on the length of our services a little bit. Uh, this is a question that came in. Does that limit the God? Does that limit God or the Holy Spirit from being able to move or work in people's lives? Um. No, <laughs> that's not convincing on that. Here's the reason I say that is, so the mindset of that question, not always, but a lot of times, the mindset of that question is that chaos is the only thing that gives freedom to the Holy Spirit. What we believe is in a, in a level of sovereignty that's greater than that, in that 
God can plan using people ahead of time. So where you hinder the Holy Spirit is when you quit asking the Holy Spirit, what do you want to do in this service? So for us as pastors, we're praying throughout the week. And for me as a primary teacher and leader in in this area of Sunday, I'm praying throughout the week and asking God, what do you want to do? So when God tells us, this is what I want you to do, then we tweak the service and change the service to meet what God has asked us to do. So I don't believe God has to move in the spontaneous only. He can do that, absolutely, and we want to be open to that. But God can move in the organized. I believe, I I had a a parent get mad at me years ago when I was in youth ministry because I had three months planned out for the series that I was going to do, and they said, you're hindering the Holy Spirit. And I thought, so your view of the Holy Spirit is that he can only plan one hour in advance or one day in advance. I believe he can plan three months in advance. So for us, we talk on a weekly basis, we pray about it, and all of our staff knows this. There are times I come and I say, hey, we're going to change something. We did it this morning, first service. I didn't tell anyone my plan until I showed up and said, hey, we are changing because we're going to pray over Jim and Cherie. And, um, and so we're going to change it. And the band said, okay, we can, we can take this song and move it. They actually brought in a different song, the song Miracles. They brought it in and we were going to go as long as it took to go. So today's questions would have been shorter if we needed them to be. So we give opening to the Holy Spirit and, um, and he leads us. So. Why don't we have any babies in the sanctuary? What's our policy on that? Okay, yeah, that, this, is, um, this is by far our most difficult policy that we've ever made, and it's uh, the one we get the most pushback on. So here's the dynamic. So this is me just being as transparent as I can. Um, it is so difficult at times because babies come into the sanctuary, and they can be a, such a distraction, and I'm being really honest here. It distracts me, and um, so uh, I wish I was able to be able to just focus in spite of what's going on but I can't. And, um, and so it's not just a policy for me, but is I'm a primary person of that. When I'm teaching and a baby is crying in the sanctuary, I lose track of my notes. I, I, can't, I can't stay focused. From my point of view, people quit looking at me. They all keep looking at the baby. And uh, so everyone starts looking. I get distracted. It even caused me one time to get a migraine in the middle of a service because I was getting so stressed about it. And, and I know the solution, people would say, is just chill out, Matt. I wish I could, but, but I just get distracted. So that's one part of it. The second one is it is distracting to the adults, too. Um, but then let's now let go to the really behind the scenes of this is we do so much for children in our church that we value every single age demographic in our church. So we want children to have the best possible experience when they come to church, but we want adults to have the best possible experience too. So what we have as a church is we have everything, we have a a group for every age group. So if you start at babies, we have a nursery for infants, we have a nursery for toddlers, we have a nursing mother's room that has a live feed of the service. We have a room upstairs for the families that are not yet ready to put their kids in nursery, and their kids can hang out in there with them. It's a live feed. There's couches. It's comfortable. We have the coffee shop venue that's just right outside this room where you can watch it live and, and be comfortable. So there are plenty of opportunities for children. Then you can go upstairs, and there's dynamic children's ministry all the way up through grade six, and then youth and adults are down here. But this is adult space, and so we don't want to distract them the same way we would never allow an adult to go up and distract a children's area just to walk in there and have a conversation. We, wouldn't, we don't want children to be a distraction in here. It's not that we don't love children, just the opposite. We do love them, but we've provided all these other environments. So what my encouragement is to parents is if you're in that season where your kid's not ready to go into nursery or you're not ready to put them there, understand it is a season, but you have to make that sacrifice during that season for the greater good. I'm a father of four. My wife had to do this. So I was on stage most of that time preaching and stuff, but she would, she just knew that when our children were that age and they weren't ready to go in nursery, she would sit in the, either in the back at that time or in the coffee shop venue or walk the hallways uh, or go outside with the kids. Now we have so much more to offer families. And so we're just asking you in this season to understand our perspective. We don't dislike children understand the difficult dynamic, give us grace in that, and utilize those areas for a season. And then um, when your kids, as soon as they're old enough, put them in nursery. We have a great team there. The sooner you can put them in there, the quicker they'll adapt to that. And um, that, that's the reason behind that. We've recently made a switch from Wednesday Night Ministries to Sunday Night Ministries. Why did we make that shift? Yeah, that was one for effectiveness. Um, so when I first started in youth ministry here, so I started the youth program 12 years ago, 
And when I started, there was what's referred to as a blackout night on Wednesdays. And that meant that no school planned activities on that. So we scheduled Wednesday f- or uh, youth ministry and first place club for Wednesday specifically because that was the best night to do ministry. So there was, there was no other reason to do Wednesday except it was the best night to do ministry. And, um, and so that was effective for years. And then that black night got lifted and they started scheduling, not just periodically scheduling, but that became a purpose night for scheduling sports and concerts and um, school activities and things like that. So it started to impact all of our ministry. So it impacted youth ministry, it impacted children's ministry. So this past year at one of the um, uh, pastor retreats where we were planning, I put it out as a topic of, hey, do we want to discuss this ever in the future? And I said, so to Joe and to Phil specifically, I said, what do you guys think about switching youth ministry and Wednesday night to another night that can be more effective? Because Joe and Phil have both been talking to me about how they're just getting crushed because these kids are in other activities. I mean, their their attendance would fluctuate 30 to 40% some nights. And so you're talking 40 to 50 kids at, at some nights. And I said, what do you guys think about switching maybe Fridays or Saturdays, Sundays? And like they, without hesitation, went, absolutely. And I was like, really? And I was like, I'm shocked by that. I said, you guys would want to change that? And they were like, absolutely. That would be a better night. We could go earlier, which would allow parents not to even have their kids out as late as they do on Wednesday night. We can go earlier. It can be effective that way. And we're doing it for the night that's most effective for the kingdom of God, not what's most convenient for us. Because honestly, Sunday is the worst night for us as staff because it just makes Sunday a very long day and even for our churchgoers to some degree. But we think it's going to be the most effective night to advance the kingdom of God with youth ministry and children's ministry. So we, uh, as leaders, we made that decision as pastors. And, uh, and so we're going to try it this fall. It, it might not work, and we can always go back. It's not sacred in that, but we're just trying to be most effective. This is a question along those same lines, but I'm just going to read it for you. It says, my yeah. family and I have been attending LCC for almost two years now. My husband works weekends during the day, so the one of the things that drew me to LCC were the Saturday night services. My children have enjoyed the Wednesday evening ministries, which have been such a blessing to our life to be able to get connected uh, with others midway through the week. It's definitely a pick-me-up to get me to through the rest of the week. Do you feel that we are conforming to the ways of the world by ha- only having services available on Sundays? And how, and how, as much, how has the church goes about make, how do we make those decisions? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I don't think we're conforming to the world because that's not why we made the decision. We made the decision to be most effective. So I can understand the perspective, and I don't know if I just was splitting hairs on that, but um, we, we made those choices for strategic purposes. So it wasn't because like the world is becoming more sinful one way, and so we're, we're pulling back from that. It, it was just what night can we be most effective? So Saturday night service did not fix our Sunday problem, and but it created other problems for us. Um, I'll be really honest. Saturday was hard on my family, very very hard. Um, it was hard on our staff too. Uh, for me, working I was I was in essence working six days a week. Friday was my Sabbath, but I was working six days because Saturday became this. Um, I was barely ever seeing my kids anymore. I, I was seeing them a couple of night, couple of hours at night, like most families, but then I didn't have the luxury of seeing my kids all day Saturday. I would go into church about noon, um, and I would be there until 6, 7 at night at times, come home. The next day, I would go to church and be there most of the day, come home, be with my kids for a little bit, then we would have connect groups. So it was really tough on our family. It was tough on the staff. But it wasn't effective. That was if it would have been effective, we would have tried to you know change something in our life. So that's why we changed that. It just wasn't effective to fix the problem um, that we were going for. Same thing with the Wednesday night ministry. Instead of being able to grow, it's, it was shrinking that ministry or, or plateauing it. We're hoping that by going to Sunday night, we're going to see more kids from the neighborhood come to our church, more people get saved, and as a result, more families saved. So if anything, we're not conforming to the world. We're fighting against the world. We're trying, we, we, we are dealing the cards that, uh, we're playing the cards that we've been dealt to some degree because now Wednesday is not the effective night. But our heart is always, what can we do to be most effective? And we just are going to try Sunday night. We think Sunday night is our next option. If it works, it works. Great. Praise God. If it doesn't, then we'll go back to the drawing board and say, let's figure out, is there another night? Is Friday night's better? Is Thursday night better? And we'll go that way. Do you think that like somebody's personal discipleship will help in that process? Because I know a lot of times it is a pick-me-up for kids to come in on the week yeah. and to get that encouragement. But can you talk a little bit about how important it is to be able to be poured into on a regular basis? Yeah, that, that was the hardest part about it. We would hear so often people said, oh, man, Wednesday gets me through the week. 
And that was the, probably the most difficult part of that decision is how can we still effectively do that? What we're hoping is the same people who would volunteer on Wednesday night and maybe go to connect groups another night, that they'll, they'll still volunteer on Sunday night and move their connect group to Wednesday night. So we think strategically uh, some of that is putting your connect group midweek will help a lot. Now, some are still going to do Sunday night because that's when we offer children's ministry, and that's okay. But just trying to get that midweek pick-me-up. But I would say uh, a part of that is our own maturity in our discipleship process. We have to get excuse me, to a point where we're um, self-feeders, where we're reading the word of God on a daily basis, we're worshiping on a daily basis, praying on a daily basis, so that we're not going from Sunday to Sunday as the only time that we're receiving. Um, I would say that for anyone, if the only time you're receiving is when you come through the church doors, you still have an immature relationship with God. You, you need to go deeper. The same way that the ideal relationship, like me and Mary, we, if we only talk twice a week, um, that would be a difficult relationship. We, our marriage would suffer. And so we need daily communication. I would say the same thing with people and God. So people need to grow in that area. They need to make that a habit in their life. Um, but we acknowledge that tension. We wish we could fix it, and we might still offer some classes on Wednesday night. We're still in the process of planning that, um, so we're trying to figure that out. Would you like to pray and end the service for us? I would us? love to. Okay. I'd be honored. Lord, I thank you so much that you are on our side. Uh, and even now, as we talk about changes and things that we've done as a church, I pray that every person here will, will understand the role that they play in this that you've called them to be a part of it, uh, to be not just blessed by this ministry, but to be a blessing to this ministry. Help them to understand their calling. Help them to, with excitement and joy, receive that calling and live it out in their lives. I pray for all of us that we will always be people of unity. We will strive to connect to each other, to, to bear each other's burdens, to encourage each other, to hold each other accountable so that we can operate like a body of Christ, which is what you designed us to be. I pray that as us as leaders are making decisions that you will continue to help our hearts to be sensitive. Obviously, we only want to follow where you lead. So, Lord, we give you glory in advance for what you are going to do in our church. We thank you for what you have done and thank you for what you are doing. And we pray this all in the powerful, precious name of Jesus. Amen.